Welcome to the First Customers Podcast. Today we have Liam Corcoran. He's the founder of an education startup called OK. He's also a found, he was a founding teacher at Synthesis, an online program formed out of a school at SpaceX. You may have heard of it as Elon Musk's experimental school that he had with his, he started with somebody for his kids. Um, but uh, Liam also was an Acton Academy guide. So Liam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for making time for us today. Um, all right. So as you know, the, the focus of our show is to talk about how different business owners, entrepreneurs, sales, marketing folks, how they got their first customers or helped businesses get their first customers. So tell us, Liam, how'd you get your first customers, man? Well, uh, it all started with me trying to figure out uh, what to do with my life. Hmm. So I had a really poor educational experience growing up and I finally found an opportunity to actually learn in a way that was meaningful to me in my senior year of high school. I left the high school that I had been at and I went into this program where I could do whatever I wanted, uh, literally anything. Cool. It was like, you tell us what you want to do and we'll tell you how you can get credit for that at school. Wow. And uh, it completely changed my life. And that year I studied hip hop. I, I rapped, uh, I wrote <laughs> just pages and pages of lyrics um, and uh, got an English credit for that. I had a radio show, Makes I had sense. an internship at a music label um, and I studied business as well. Um, I didn't exactly know what I wanted to do, but like music business was an idea I had because I love music and I thought that could be a way I could kind of get involved. I thought it'd be interesting to work with artists um, as an artist myself. So, okay. So the rest of this podcast will be done in bars. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, so I was 19 and I had a dream, um, <laughs> but <laughs> no. Uh, that, that would be really impressive if I could do that, but, um, <laughs> freestyling has never been my, my strong suit. Um, I could, we could do a written version of this and maybe I could yeah. do my whole life story right now, but <laughs> yeah. So I, I thought about music business, um, but then I kind of switched my focus, um, more towards, um, focusing locally on like my community. I don't remember exactly what it was that turned me away from music business. I know I visited a school in Florida and I just didn't really like the energy there. Um, and I realized that I might get caught in an industry which was more exploitative and just kind of like a, a big space where I wouldn't be able to make a real meaningful difference. And yeah. I grew up as a very privileged person um, and I think my parents made me aware of that. Um, and that made me recognize that uh, I had an opportunity to like give back to the world. Um, and so, yeah, I decided to study social entrepreneurship at a local college. And I didn't exactly want to get right into school. So thankfully my brother had taken a gap year and um, that inspired me to do the same. So I just bagged coffee at a local uh, coffee company for like nine months and made a bunch of money and then went to Europe and traveled, um, did things that, you know, a young person wants to do. And yeah, then I came back and went to school uh, and started school as a 20 year old. So that nice. really kind of shaped the way that I went through that year um, and it was fun. I enjoyed school. Uh, I enjoyed all my classes for the most part, except maybe like uh, financial accounting. That's never been my strong suit, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was, it was a good experience. But the thing is, is that I looked around and I realized that a lot of the people who were also freshmen at the time, didn't really have an idea of who they were 
and what they wanted to do with their lives. And I, I thought this was a crisis because I was like, all right, y- y'all are here spending $40,000 a year to go to a private college and you're just kind of like figuring it out. And I mm-hmm. thought that was insane. Um, you know, I was spending still quite a bit of money, but not quite that because I was in state, thankfully. <laughs> but um, I thought that was wild. And I had spent a lot of my gap year um, researching what it meant to be human by like reading different religious texts. Like I read the Bible, the Quran, um, ancient philosophy. And then that got me into like current psychology and neuroscience and trying to understand like what it meant to be human and what our potential was as a species. And so, you know, I, I thought I was 20 years old. I thought I was, you know, I knew everything. And I was like, all right, we got to do something to solve this problem. So this idea came to me um, of creating a brand that instead of trying to sell you something and having a logo that reminded you that you want to buy something and that you need something, you would need, you need to fill this you know, hole within you. The brand instead would just reflect back to you um, yourself. And it would just make you think about who you are as a person and make you think about how much you care about the people in your life. And I thought of this idea that it could be a little stick figure. Uh, it could be very simple, black and white, and I'll call it okay. And that's kind of all I had. And I decided to drop out of school. Hmm. So... Yeah. Then, I, then, you know, from there, it was like, okay, I just dropped out of school. Now I got to figure out how to make a living and like turn this not really much of an idea into something. Um, and I just started working odd jobs. At some point I was working like four jobs um, <laughs> and uh, just like putting things together as a college dropout. And I started holding these meetings that were based upon this club that I started at my college called Do You, which was all about like understanding yourself and figuring out what it meant to really be yourself. So I started these meetings, didn't really know what I was doing, but I was like, let's get together and talk about real things, talk about who we are, who we want to be. Um, and that led me to, you know, like coaching a couple friends of mine who were like, this is super fun. Um, we really enjoy like, thinking about these questions and like, can you, you know, spend some time with us one-on-one doing more focused work. So I like just coached a couple friends for free. I would meet up with them once a week. That was cool. I had no idea what I was doing, but they were, you know, trusting and willing to like learn with me. And then I'm getting to the first customer. I swear. Uh, it's just, a, it's a long journey. <laughs> oh, this is good. This is good. It's a long journey. So yeah, I just kept holding these meetings and iterating on, you know, what is a meaningful way that we could spend our time together? If we have an hour of time um, and I'm trying to help people understand themselves and understand how they can make an impact on the world, how can I do that? So I just kept playing with ideas and I started holding these public meetings. It was just anyone in the community could come to. I just posted in the newspaper which people actually use uh, in our community. And um, this guy that I had met through a friend of mine who was much older than us, taking some like graduate courses, um, he started coming to the meetings and then he was like, hey, can you coach me? I'll pay you $20 an hour. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, don't, you shouldn't pay me. <laughs> you know, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, but he was like, no, I, I really value these experiences that I have at these group meetings. And I just like some time one-on-one to, you know, continue to talk about these things and have the support and accountability of someone who, you know, knows the importance of like developing, you know, practices like meditation or, you know, productivity practices. And so I started doing that. And that was, that was my first customer. It was just $20, a $20 bill uh, for an hour session. Um, and 
that's okay. that's how it all kind of got started. So what did you do in that first session? <sighs> that is a great question. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I tell people like so much of my work is about reflection mm. and spending time thinking back about your experiences so that you can learn from them. You know, because so often we we just have experiences and we if we don't take the time to think about them, then we might not be getting any value from them whatsoever. Right. We might internalize some things, which is good. But if we're not really thinking mm -hmm. critically about the past, then, you know, we don't we're missing a huge opportunity to learn. And one of the reasons why I do that is, you know, because of all the research that supports that, but also because I recognize that I'm really bad at reflecting. Um, and it was something that I just wasn't doing. Uh, and so this is an example of that. I don't remember what we did in that first meeting, but I should, I should have record of that. Yeah. Um, but you, you know, it was simple. Like my, my approach was, um, listen, I, I don't know anything. I'm young, um, but all I can do is listen and ask questions. Uh, and then encourage you and push you, right? And those things are normal things that like we do with our friends, uh, but just going into that space and being intentional about it um, was, I guess, valuable um, to him and, and I guess has been to other people as well because that's continued to be my approach, obviously, as I've refined it and learned things, but sticking to that core of just asking questions, encouraging, and helping people develop practices that can you know support their goals um that's, okay that's really cool we've done it um so with all the ai tools coming out right now this huge explosion that we're seeing uh we were on vacation a week ago and uh i was talking to my assistant the ai <laughs> chat gpt and i was like how can i get the most out of this vacation and one of the mm. things that said was like basically like meditation reflection or journaling about your experiences so that you can integrate them into your daily life moving forward. And I was like, Whoa, AI easy there. Just <laughs> counseling me. You know, I was like, man, that was, that was good. That was deep. But, uh, and so anyway, I tried some of that as, you know, I don't really, uh, journal on a daily basis. Usually, you know, I've got kind of like a running Google doc that I use as kind of a way to, just document thoughts and ideas and things. And it's easily searchable, you know, to go back to, and then I'll review it every once in a while. And anyway, so I tried some of that and it reminded me of what you were saying that taking that time to reflect and it did, it's like, it's like marinating on the experiences in the same way you get more out of a meal. If you slow it down, you know, really think about what you're eating and everything. And it seemed to have that similar effect on you know the vacation time and reflecting like what did we actually even do today like i don't even remember you know and going back through and just documenting talking about how different things felt while we were doing different things and it was cool so uh that's interesting that you brought that that part up and that's a big part of what you do uh, i wasn't aware of that aspect of what you did so that's that's really neat because that's been on my mind a lot lately after vacation that whole idea yeah. of integrating experiences into your daily life. Like if there's some way to benefit more from the things that happen through some kind of healthy process. And it sounds like you, you are in that space. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think part of it is like just trying to figure out simple things that can make a big impact. Um, yeah. And you know, with reflection, one way I think about it is like, if you reflect, then you won't be worrying about the past. Um, if you set intentions and create clear goals, you won't be worrying about the future. You know where you've been, you know where you're going. Now you can be present. And I think that, you know, it's, it's a simple concept. But it, it actually, it's, it's hard in practice um, because it's hard to make that time. Um, you know, I think culturally, like it's difficult to carve out those times in our days. Um, and obviously like every self-help person in the world is, is telling us we need to do it. Um, yeah. But that doesn't make it easy um, because we, you know, live complicated lives. 
Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think just kind of reiterating that point is something that I've tried to do um, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. So what are some of the, maybe get into some of the details of like maybe some tactics that you would tell somebody or walk somebody through like, is like journaling or meditation you mentioned? Uh, are, is there anything else? Yeah. So like I said, I, I've tried to experiment with a lot of things um, mm -hmm. over the course of my work. Um, but I think that when it comes down to it, um, I really like to hold the idea of practice um, above everything else. So um, making sure that you have a reflective practice, you have a practice of thinking about the future. And, you know, if it's setting a goal for the day or setting a goal for, you know, 10 years from now, fantastic, right? Um, I always meet people where they're at. Some people are, you know, hyper-focused on success and moving things forward. Other people are really depressed and are just trying to get out of bed in the morning, right? Um, and so the recommendation of what practice will be different. But in the end, as long as you're developing some practice, you're building some sort of positive momentum. And you're building neural pathways in your brain, um, which are going to make it easier for you to engage in that practice um, as you go forward. And it's going to allow you to develop more practices, right? Um, if you practice the skill of practicing or habit building, right? <laughs> yeah. um, then think about what you can do. It's like, okay, well, now I want to learn something new. Fine, right? You've been working on that skill for a long time. Um, all it is is taking time to be focused on one thing um, and then spending some time reflecting on that and thinking about what you need to do next. Um, the other thing that I love to talk about is flow. And um, the, you know, I, well, actually I'm going to pause there and just mm -hmm. uh, see what your understanding of flow is. Cause I think that it's something that, you know, some people know a lot about yeah. it. Some people don't know anything. Um, I think of flow, I think of like, in the context of getting into a flow state where you're into kind of work where you're not worried about the time or anything. You're just in the moment of doing whatever you're doing. You feel good while you're doing it. You're kind of in an uninterrupted flow of work or activity. Exactly. Right. And so that concept was really powerful to me uh, when I learned about it. And I realized that, you know, if, we can help people get into flow states more. Um, you know, we can experience more joy, more productivity, um, and our lives can kind of drastically change um, if we remember like a few simple things. Um, and so one of my favorite things regarding flow, I won't go into every detail of it, um, is just the idea of having a diversified flow portfolio, as I call it. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, you might meet someone who really like derives all their happiness from one activity and their self-worth is really tied to maybe their job or, you know, a hobby of theirs. But, you know, let's say if you're a tennis player, what happens if you break your hand and you can't play tennis for a few months? You know, you were getting a lot of joy out of tennis um, and now all of that's gone. So it's important to have multiple sources of joy. Um, and that is just like, a, you, you can address that simply by taking stock of your life and identifying the different activities where you experience joy. And, you know, thinking about, all right, you know, is this enough? Like, uh, are, there, are there some different ways that I could experience it? Like, you know, should I make sure that I'm doing some sort of um, physical activity and uh, meeting new people um, and, you know, learning something new all the time so that you're not fully invested in one thing. That's cool. So that's the flow portfolio. <laughs> yeah. Multiple ways of getting into the flow state. Yeah. That's cool. I think it's interesting that um, the way you got your first customer 
it kind of follows this pattern I'm seeing or this whatever meta pattern or something, but uh, across all the different people I've talked to, it seems like people who talk to the people or the target audience, target potential customer or their target customers, the ones who talk to them before they start their business, you know, seem to have that best chance of getting some traction, getting those cut, those first customers. Um, and it seems like that's what you did. You were, you know, meeting, you weren't charging anybody anything at first. You were kind of getting deeper into, I guess, the community of what ended up being your, your customers um, before ever asking for money or anything. You were just learning about your target audience. Um, and so that's interesting that that's a similar pattern that I see across all these other types of businesses. The ones who have that strongest connection with their target audience have an easier, easier time getting those first customers. Um, so how did you, you get customers after that first $20 bill or how'd your business grow after that? Yeah. So my business has been all about just following whatever opportunity is in front of me. Um, because I've never known exactly what it is I should be doing, yeah. right? I know I know it's in what it involves. I know that it's about helping people understand their power and develop it. Um, but that can take a lot of forms. So I really just kind of follow um, the serendipity that presents itself to me. And the reason why I can do that um, is because I haven't gone full time with my business, right? If yeah. I was trying to make a, a consistent salary and hire other people, um, then I would need to be really focused on, you know, developing a target market and yeah. building that audience and scaling of these different things. Yeah. But what I've done is continue to work for um, projects that are aligned with my values, and then on the side or in tandem, um, continue to do my work and learn and just like go wherever it takes me. So I'll give you another example. Um, there was this thing called a Pecha Kucha night, which is this Japanese uh, concept of just like sharing um, an idea for I think like eight minutes. And every slide is like 20 seconds. And it's this, it's very constrained. You like have to follow this format. Um, but it's just a way of like bringing people together and sharing lots of ideas. Hmm. So it was something that was just happening in my community and me and my friend who was involved in okay at the time, just like coming to the free meetings. And he was one of the people that I had done coaching with. We decided to do it. And so we just shared what we had been doing. And afterwards, this woman came up to me and was like, this was really interesting. Would you be interested in coming and running one of these um, sessions um, at this um, place that I run? Uh, and the reason why I stumble there is because it was a residential house for students in college who need extra support. So who might have learning disabilities or developmental disabilities. Um, and yeah, that was a place Sorry, I'm in New York City. If you heard that, uh, yeah, the sounds of the streets. <laughs> but that was a place where I, I ran workshops for, uh, I think, the next year, um, every week. And that was just pure serendipity, right? It was just sharing my idea with the world and seeing what came of it. Um, and then from there, you know, I think the... The next story I would share is that I went to a conference in Long Island to present uh, the work of an ed tech company that I was working for. And I had gotten that job completely serendipitously uh, from a former teacher of mine, um, okay. who was my teacher in that senior year of high school and who helped change my life um, by giving me the freedom to learn what I wanted. And she started a company around that concept, trying to create tech to enable that. And so cool. I started working with them, just like doing whatever, you know, <laughs> like anything that they needed done um, when there was maybe six employees. And then I became the implementation manager. Um, so taking the technology and 
giving it to schools, training the teachers, students, administrators how to use it. And I was doing this presentation at a conference. They had sent me down to do it. And uh, the conference had tech issues. And I wasn't able to do the presentation. And this is a tech presentation. Like I'm showing everyone how the technology works. And I found out that I wasn't going to be able to do it um, like moments before I was supposed to start. Wow. So I decided to do an okay workshop. And I was like, okay, pivot, you know, fine. I'll just do something that I know will be of interest to people. And so I do this workshop and one of the people there, um, two years later, reaches out to me and asks me to come to their uh, high school and do like a keynote presentation. And that was my first ever like paid speaking engagement um, where, you know, I got up on stage, talked to the high schoolers for an hour. Um, I performed um, some music and told them about my life story and how um, service had been like at the center of it, you know, being of service to people doing volunteer work, um, which is kind of a whole nother story. But that was just complete serendipity, right? I'm just thrown in the situation where I have to pivot. And so I share something that is genuine and someone connects with it. And then someone else in that room uh, invited me to another conference and I go to that conference, meet their boss, and they invite me to come start and act an academy at their um, homeschooling center. And that meant um, I left Vermont, which I had always said I was never going to leave. But I go down to uh, I go down to Connecticut of all places, which I knew nothing about. I had no interest in moving there, but they gave me this opportunity to run my own school, um, and I I couldn't. I couldn't turn it down. Uh, it was it was a way for me to um, really test myself and also to make an impact on students' lives. Um, and yeah, those two things happened just because of doing this kind of like spur of the moment workshop. Huh. Okay, putting yourself out there and then getting referrals from there. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so do you still do speaking engagements and that kind of thing? Or are you just focused on other types of work now? Yeah. So right now, um, I am doing synthesis, which I can actually draw a line to synthesis from this past story, um, uh, which mm -hmm. could be interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then I'm also managing a co-working space because I got tired of working at synthesis, which is purely online. Mm -hmm. Um, and I am living in New York City, and I was like, what would be an interesting way to meet people and get out of the house every day? And so I found a job at a co-working space, and now I you know, meet someone new every single day, um, which is endlessly fascinating. And then I still do synthesis uh, part-time, and gotcha. um, still, st I still run free OK workshops. Um, hmm. So yeah, the way that I ended up at Synthesis though, was I uh, ran this Acton Academy for a year. It was with elementary age students though. Um, and I wanted to work with teens, but kind of like after hiring me, they were like, oh, sorry, like we really need someone to do the elementary age kids. We have someone for the, the teens, but they couldn't do elementary. Could you do it? You have experience with that age group. And so I said, yes. And that year, I started off with two students in my micro school, two seven-year-olds. <laughs> and then by the end of the year, I had uh, nine students. And so I was the teacher, but then I would also, you know, give tours to prospective families and try and sell them on this idea of joining, you know, a couple other kids who are different ages because this is a program where, you know, seven through 12 year olds all learn together. Um, and I had to sell them on, on this idea, sell them on this philosophy that I'm not going to be teaching their kids anything. I'm just going to be facilitating their learning. So they're going to be spending three hours in the morning learning online. And I'm not going to answer any questions that they have. I'm just going to ask them questions to help them get to the answer. 
and help them figure out how they can solve the problems they're experiencing. And so that was a great experience in sales <laughs> to try and, yeah. you know, inspire people to understand that this could have an impact um, on their lives and, you know, also connect with people um, in a real way because I'm their salesperson and I'm going to be their teacher. Um, so I can't, I can't be saying anything that's not true either, right? I have to be 100% honest and truthful with them. So after that experience, um, thankfully, I was able to hand off the school to someone else who really wanted to do it. So they took it over. And the next year, I kind of mentored them as they continued it. But I was able to create a uh, program for the teens at the co-working or at the homeschooling space. Okay. And that was purely based on my okay philosophy and the work I had done. So I gave them coaching. Um, and then we had an hour each morning as a group. And, and we would do a lot of reflection, you know, a lot of uh, goal setting. Um, and then I created this game that would enable them to learn about finance, civics, um, and health. Hmm. And it was not a great game, <laughs> um, but I started playing with this idea of how could I you know, create an experience where the students have the power over what they do. And I thought a game would be an interesting way to do that, right? So I give them a set of challenges, um, but they can kind of move through those challenges um, as they see fit. And they have to work collaboratively to figure out what they want to do, how they're going to do it. Um, and yeah, uh, that that was my first foray into games and education. Uh, and then just through a random connection during the pandemic, I ended up creating this like custom game for a family. Um, and they paid me $100 an hour to come to their house and facilitate this game for uh, five kids uh, oh, wow. that I that I created each week for them. Um, and that was the first time I realized that maybe I could be worth a hundred dollars an hour. That totally changed my conception of my, my value yeah, um, because yeah. I really have been always like, Oh yeah, I'll do everything for free. You know, $20, don't give me $20. Let me do it for free. <laughs> um, and yeah, is that, I've just, is that a Vermont influence or is that just the way you're raised? <laughs> you know, I think there's, there's a negative side to it. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. so it's like not valuing yourself right yeah and my dad is also very like self-effacing and um yeah would never uh you know is always like willing to to do things for free or just help yeah. out um, well, servant-hearted so sounds like yeah yeah service uh, he, minded. he's been leading a non-profit for like 10 years gotcha. uh, making like no money <laughs> but working his ass off yeah yeah um so, yeah, I think I learned it from that. But also, you know, at the end of the day, like with this type of work, um, it it gives me so much um, satisfaction to help people. Right. And I also feel like everyone should have access to this for free. Right. Uh, everyone in the world should have someone willing to ask them questions, encourage them and help them figure out how to, you know, be a happy, you know, person, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. But, um, but, you know, on the other side of things, it's also important to get money so that you can invest in yourself. You can, uh, when you get more money, you're able to reach more people, right? right. So that's been a slow, slow lesson that I, I've been learning. <laughs> um, but this experience, you know, being paid $100 an hour was different to me. Um, and I was, I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then I saw this job posting on LinkedIn by Josh Don, the founder of Synthesis, um, who I just been following on LinkedIn, uh, for a few years because I had heard about the school he started, um, at SpaceX and I was curious about it and there was just no information online. Yeah. Um, so I was like, I'll just follow this guy see what happens. And he posted this and I was like, oh, this is games and education. Um, this is perfect. And yeah. so Sounds I applied like and experience perfectly lines up with it. 
Yeah. And, you know, two years earlier, it wouldn't have, but I just kind of gotten interested in these, this idea of games and education. And, um, I of course was like nervous. I wasn't going to get the job, but, um, you know, there was like perfect alignment. Um, and so, you know, from the start, it was kind of a, a dream come true to be able to, to work with synthesis and, you know, be part of something that, you know, their goal is to impact a billion students, right? They're, they're shooting for for global influence, um, and so it's been great to be a, a part of that. That's really cool. So I'm I'm pulling little principles out from what you're saying as we go here, and um, so every episode I try to learn what I can from each person, um, and see how it contrasts with what I'm doing. So I'm sitting here in my home office, working remote, never seeing anybody new. <laughs> And uh, there's definitely value to uh, putting yourself in those kind of situations, like you're saying, you managing that uh, that co-working space because you kind of increase the chances for some serendipitous connection. You know, the more exposure you get to more people, the more connections you make, the higher the chance that one of those connections is going to lead to something either profitable or good for your life or, or something positive, you know. And it, it seems like that's one of the principles I'm seeing that you follow is doing things that increase the opportunity for like a, uh, outsized reward, you know, even though it's not just for the sake of a reward, the, the way you're doing things, or the reason you're doing things, but it's like, that's what you're putting yourself in is to the, these situations that are low, with low risk, high reward potential situations. Absolutely. Where, yes. If you could analyze and say, well, he could be making more money doing this or that or whatever, but it's like you're optimizing for connection, which is interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there was a quote that was on the desk of one of my college professors. Um, and I, I believe <laughs> to quote, I think I can quote it correctly, which is uh, fortune favors the prepared. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've heard, of, I've heard iterations of that. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I can't attribute it to the correct person, but um, that quote has stuck with me. Um, and I think there's something really powerful about, um, you know, being ready for serendipity, right? Um, good luck, bad luck. Like if you are prepared to receive good luck, then you're more likely to be able to receive it, right? If you put yourself in situations where you could be lucky, yeah, um, then you're more likely to. Yeah. If you never roll the dice, you'll never roll sixes or whatever's good. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right. And so you got to synthesis through, you know, this process of putting yourself out there, getting connections and referrals and just from doing things. And then you, uh, got that job. And so now is that the state of things is where you're at synthesis part-time manage the co-working space and then the okay meetings is, is what they're called. That's right. Yeah. And okay. so, you know, I, uh, I'm also rapping. Um, so oh, shoot. Uh, I, I continue like a, to rap, a, a, a name for the mic or for the stage or whatever. Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> If you search Moses Rainbow oh, on, on uh, Instagram, Moses Rainbow, you'll you'll find my Instagram, and that's actually my middle name. You can't can't make Moses. these things up. Moses Rainbow, yeah. Moses Rainbow. Um, the whole thing is your middle name. The whole thing. The whole Whoa. thing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I thought tells you, you a little. Moses. No, no. <laughs> tell, tells you a little bit about you know growing up in Vermont. The parents, the kind of parents yeah, yeah. Very Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So they can check you out, Moses Rainbow. Are you on like Spotify and that kind of thing? I I'm everywhere oh, where people find people. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Moses okay. Rainbow, and then uh, Loki L O K I, uh, Loki the Nameless is my uh, rapper name. Okay. Um, oh, so okay. Moses, Ra Moses rainbow is kind of like a catch all for the different artistic things I do. Um, cause I, okay. I do other things, uh, 
kind of serendipitously, like if, if I find the opportunity to, yeah. um, but dude, yeah, we missed no. out on the intro. I should have added rapper and artist and all this other stuff to the intro earlier. That's okay. You know, you gotta, you gotta have some secrets, uh, that surprise people. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, um, everybody listening, check out Loki, the nameless on Spotify and all the places, Moses rainbow on all the social media platforms. And, uh, we'll have some show notes with links to, to everything you're involved with. And, uh, your LinkedIn and whatever company leaks you want to put in there. But uh, Liam, thanks for being on the show, man. This has been really interesting. It's it's cool to hear your perspective. It's a lot different than a, the, a lot of the other businesses I've talked to, a lot of other entrepreneurs and stuff. It's kind of a refreshing, peaceful take. You've got a very well thought, like a thoughtful approach to things. It's really cool. I, I appreciate you, you know, reaching out and making this happen. You know, I, the last thing I'll say is, um, I have never really taken uh, the approach where I need to make my business my full-time job and grow it. Um, however, okay, from like day one, I knew I was going to work on it for the rest of my life. And I still am working on it. And I also, you know, we'll, we'll see where it goes, right? Um, yeah. So I've also like developed a web app. That'll be the final thing that I plug here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so flowers.community um, is a place where you can go and you can reflect on who you are and who you want to become. And when you sign up, you get a reminder each year on your birthday um, to engage in this process. Oh, that's and cool. so that's, that's a, a project that I'm going to continue to develop. Um, and, you know, I want to continue to create spaces and ways for people to understand and develop their power. Um, and I'll be doing it for the rest of my life. Um, so uh, if anyone is interested in, in following a very, very long journey uh, that will probably yield, you know, way too many free things um, <laughs> that <laughs> give you outsized impact in your life, um, you know, I look forward to like connecting. I also like, I'm happy just to have conversations with, anyone anytime um as as we've learned today uh, but yeah paris thank you so much uh and uh i hope to continue talking to you and yeah, learn from sure. you more all right everybody we'll see you next week bye